Hi everyone, uh, I'm Brenton Ray. Um, I'm the Partnerships Manager for the New South Wales Spatial Digital Twin uh, under Live NSW. So we'll get started. So it was um, really interesting to hear uh, the previous previous talk um, and the definitions and how well they aligned with ours. So that was really reassuring. Um, so I just thought we'd, we'd start the same on how we're defining it. And um, it's come from the, the very early Gemini principles as well. So uh, a digital twin being a digital replica of the real world. Um, and as we've just seen, data, modeling, visualization. Um, so these are what we've just seen, that the localized digital twins for roads, for buildings, for engineering, and so on. What is a spatial digital twin? Um, so as, as you can see there, a spatially enabled digital twin is combining all of these digital twins and positioning information uh, covering that geographic space above and below ground, um, integrating the smart sensors and producing a real world picture um, uh, geographically of, of a digital twin. So I just thought I'd start with some, um, I guess, some principles on, on how we um, have, have started this project and what we've, the journey we've been on for the last be four, five or six years now. Um, so what we're trying to deliver is better insights, better decisions and better outcomes for, for New South Wales government, for um, New South Wales citizens, for industry, for, for everyone really, um, and to enable that transformative change in the way New South Wales government does business and, and shaping that future of New South Wales. So I'll just bring all these up quickly. Um, obviously, being conscious of the of the time as well. Um, so these pillars of, of how we wanted to deliver our spatial digital twin um, is around customer experience. So um, spatial services is part of the uh, Department of Customer Service. So the customer experience is is at the heart of what we're trying to deliver, and um, whether that's other other government agencies or mums and dads out there. Um, and communities. Uh, security and privacy is becoming more and more uh, critical to how we, how, we do, how we do work and with digital twins um, and sharing data, being able to restrict certain data sets, but also have as much open data as possible um, and, and having the uh, cybersecurity backends to support that. Uh, openness with, with data, with products, and everything's openly available to maximize the value um, across the community. Federated data is one that I'll spend a bit more time on. Um, but really what we're looking at there is we don't want to have all of the data because there is just way too much of that. Uh, what we want is the custodians of the data to be able to uh, update the data and have those um, published as APIs and then uh, that gets consumed into all of the digital twins. So we're not saying ours is the digital twin. It is a digital twin. Um, but it should be a place of discoverability of data. Um, interoperability, as we've just seen in the last one, being able to, to be able to use different data sets um, together in the same environment, uh, having the consistent agreed standards, policies, and guidelines uh, is critical. And being future-ready workforce as well, um, being able to, to get into our STEM classes. And, you know, for me personally, I'd love to see geography and science students in, in high school using um, digital twins and that just becoming a standard way of, of working. And that all fed into our roadmap. Um, these were just some things from our early days that could have been improved. Uh, I won't labour too much on it because um, I really want to get into the what what is the digital twin but um the the colors really represent what what our products are now so being able to see and explore data easily um, customers having influence over what's built in their communities and a single source of truth um, for data and place-based data um, moving from government driven to customer driven um, so we want our products to be able to, to be what the customer needs them to be and um, be able to, to meet that demand. So our products, and you'll hear me speak about them uh, independently, are the SDT, so Spatial Digital Twin Explorer product. Um, so people may have seen 
already our um, DTVS or the Digital Twin Visualization Service um, that we released a few years ago with Data61 CSIRO. Uh, and really it's about these customer journeys. So as a lay user, being able to spatially search, explore and provide feedback, or as an advanced user, being able to model, analyze and report. Uh, this product is being updated at the moment to um, take in our, our six maps, which you may be aware of, as well as this DTVS into one uh, application that is able to deliver on both of those use cases. Um, currently, they're separate. We have the Spatial Digital Twin Stories, and this is trying to meet that customer need and community engagement. So being able to take a customer through a spatial narrative to get feedback. So whether that's a, a new road development, a new hospital development, um, getting away from just artistic impressions, but how does it actually fit into the real world? How does it affect me in my day-to-day -day life? Um, sort of getting spatial data out there to the 95% of the population who aren't spatial experts. Um, and the SDT data portal, uh, which is that one-stop shop and single front door to be able to do that. Um, there's those three products and some of the challenges which um, will be coming a later slide, uh, this is the reason I've put this one in, are addressed in some of these. So I won't put too much time into them. Some of these are around data and some of them are around foundations, but um, emergency services features heavily being able to get um, time critical data out there processed and out to emergency service providers. Um, we have the gravity model for New South Wales, which is a huge undertaking. Um, the FSDF, which is our found, which is the sorry Foundation Spatial Data Framework transformation from 2D to 3D and 4D. Um, the Automated Infrastructure Data Pipeline, otherwise known as the AIDP, uh, will come to one of our challenges shortly. Um, automated Imagery Elevation Processing, Standards, Policies and Guidelines, um, as we've seen, to, to get that consistency uh, across different jurisdictions and as we're seeing globally um, is, is absolutely critical. Um, as we said, security, so ICT, infrastructure and cybersecurity and self-service APIs. So this is what our live program encompasses. So it's, it's quite a huge program. What does the spatial digital twin enable? Um, anal analyzing change through time. So when we say three and 4D, we do mean being able to look at uh, the, the time component. So not just back through time, but also being able to, if we use the cadaster as an example, being able to look at the changes of cadaster over time, but also the proposed cadaster for new developments. So we can see forward in time and start modeling and planning that as well. Uh, integration of uh, live data feeds. So we've got transport, air quality, um, you can see one of the early bus models there, which is a um, blue box. Now they look like buses. Uh, but whether that's fuel check, um, energy generation, uh, localized end count cameras that were able to uh, be published and, uh, and visualized. And then visualizing the future as well. So being able to bring in GLTF models, BIM models, um, either IFC, um, you know, preferably the OGC compliant open ones, but having the mechanisms in the pipeline to be able to bring in um, other data as well and visualize that in the real world. So putting that in with the reality mesh, putting that in with the infrastructure data that sits beneath it. Our first challenge for New South Wales is, um, as mentioned earlier, New South Wales is a really big place, 801,000 square kilometers. Um, that, that's a challenge in itself, being able to have a spatial digital twin to, to cover all of that. So obviously, probably like everyone else with digital twins, we look at world leaders and, um, you know, the, the smart Singapore has been at the forefront of that for a really long time. And we look at um, the size of, of Singapore comparative to New South Wales at 728 square kilometres. So just to be able to give that as an example, we have 78 local government areas with a size that are greater than Singapore. Um, so for us to be able to maintain data sets to that level um, as a government, not just as spatial services, is a huge undertaking. And that's where the federation from the custodians of the data sets becomes critical. Um, no one agency will be able to manage all of that data. Um, and this is where we're wanting to see that change across, across government, 
um, and uh, probably across industry, is how data has been managed in the past to how it needs to be managed in this federated model. So we've put up this little honeycomb one and we can see all the different agencies there and the data was always managed in silos. There was a lot of duplication across government. There might be some sharing between similar agencies, but generally it, the data was managed locally. Uh, in this federated ecosystem, what we're wanting to do is, as I've mentioned, have the custodians publish the data via APIs um, and have the collaboration and data sharing agreements in place. All of that aligned with authority of ground control. So our positioning is critical for this model to work. Um, and as I said, all the data is then published into those foundation spatial data themes and able to be consumed uh, more broadly. So that's um, awesome for open, open data, but obviously there's restricted data as well. Um, our emergency information coordination unit is one of these agency, one of the business units where that restricted data is critical to be able to plan for, for events such as New Year's Eve and um, you know, manage against um, say 9-11 level events. Um, so getting access to data when it's required is really important. So the New South Wales Spatial Digital Twin in the portal, uh, we're supporting open, secure and restricted data sets. So it's easy to discuss the, the two extremes of that. So open data, as it sounds, is all of the data open, visible, and um, uh, even CC by level. Secure is completely restricted, locked off, and only available to those that have access to view it. And restricted data fits in the middle of those. So sensitive data can remain restricted, but also data is able to be discovered, but not necessarily viewed or accessed but then able to be requested to be able to be viewed. Um, so that's a, that's a really important distinction there. Um, there's the discoverability of the data as well. Um, but not just as an entire data set as well. Uh, the, S, the SDT data portal enables publishing of views. So if we take a, a BIM, for example, um, certain, say the shell and maybe the layout might be open data. And that can be published as an open data set from the single source. Um, that may have uh, subsequent layers, which then become more and more restricted or only accessible to certain groups, and they can be published. But when the central model is updated, all of those views are published um, via those APIs. So, um, um, yeah, not having to to multiple publish multiple data sets multiple times. And this is the the ecosystem vision. So we've got all the federating data sets, which I've just spoken to. All of these will be consumed um, by different applications and tools. So BIM, digital engineering, GIS professionals, analytics, insight driven, asset managers, um, they're all going to pull in all of these different APIs. Um, but being able to find them uh, from, a, from a single location. So if it's on our spatial digital tweet, it might be transport APIs or environment APIs you'd be able to find all of them and visualize them there. But if you're on a different one, you might be on um, the environment environmental portal, being able to find the spatial services data sets on there and use them there is equally important. So we want just want the data to be used. That's, that's the important part of, of this. Um, all of this then feeds into those localized digital twins, uh, as we've seen with the roads, infrastructure, building, physical assets. And that's really where all of that comes together into that live New South Wales or um, the spatial digital twin. Um, just to use those colors again, and I like pictures. So um, at the core of what we're delivering is that uh, spatial digital twin data portal has been known and uh, will be seen as the spatial collaboration portal. Um, that's what's um, holding all of our data, all our data gets published to that. Um, it has uh, S3 buckets connecting it in for the larger data sets, say the reality meshes, some of the BIMs. So we're not making it too cumbersome in the actual portal catalog itself, but that's where all the APIs are being driven from. Um, our SDT Explorer product and Stories products are then a wrapper around that. So all of the data that is used in those comes from the spatial collaboration portal and any authentication back to it goes back to that. So if there's a data set that's updated, um, whether it's a community engagement, it might be, a, we'll use BIM again, 
um, and that model gets updated, it will get then get updated in the Explorer product and the Stories products as well. And for other government portals such as Seed, we are federating those via API. Um, this is already complete for open data sets. So um, we'll come back to that, of the distinction of open data sets being collaborated in um, the challenges part. So um, I'll, I normally would jump into just showing these, but I might just go through the slides and if we've got time, I'll duck back to just demonstrating these quickly. This is what the uh, data portal looks like. Um, if anyone has been there before and um, no, it's going to be easy just to go to it, I think. Let's just bring this over. So has that come up on the screen? I'm just trying to see if it's there. Yep, cool. So without being logged in, you don't have to have a login for this. You can go to browse data. Um, you can see the New South Wales data themes. This is the foundation spatial data framework themes that we were talking about. Um, you're then able to say, let's pick land parcel property. Oh, that was a, that worked well. You can go into those <laughs> and not be not be logged in, and um, you're able to to view data sets. Um, so I've clicked imagery here, historical imagery, two thousand and five, for example. Um, we've got the metadata on there. You can grab this API, copy it, bring that into whatever application you're using, um, and and that's really part of that important. Uh, data sharing and having these open arrangements. If I was to go back to the home, um, there is some map viewers here as well. And um, so our six maps viewer, the DTVS is this one. We've got historical imagery. There's, there's a lot of different viewers that are created flood mapping. If I go to the groups, as I'm not logged in, this is an open group. If I then sign in, he's hoping my password hasn't updated in the last day. And I log in. There we go. And now I go to groups. This is part of that security and access. Now you can see these are the groups that I have access to. So one of my groups is called Brent and Sharing, which makes a lot of sense. Um, if we go into that one, we can see the data sets that have been shared with me. And if I look at the members, um, that's uh, Phil's the owner and, and I'm a member of my group. Um, to be able to then share data to a, to a broader range, we would just add more people to this group or groups to the group. Um, it could be on a group level or on a data set level. So we'll just go back to the presentation now, um, assuming that has come back up for everyone. So um, security data managed by the data custodian is the important part there. It's being published by the data custodian. Um, the groups created and data can be visualized, which I didn't show in the in the um, portal as well. Um, it's got Esri map viewers, so you can load the data set and, and visualize it in there as well. Um, we also have our stories um, product. If we bring this one over, I just want to make sure that is still sharing. Um, where are we? Sorry. I lost the uh, the workshop here. There we go. So that should be updating now. Yep. So this would this is a um, spatial an SDT story. So this is one we've created for the live NSW program and is open and um, people can go and use that um, now. But it's it's what we would use to get to the the community. We want to be able to put these as a as a, yes, I, can, I just saw that pop up. I can share the link to that as well. Um, I'll share the links to, to all of these at the end, if you'd like. Um, so to be able to engage with community, whether it's a, a development um, in the center of a, of a city, if it's a new proposed highway, whatever it is, um, we're able to develop these stories and take users through a spatial narrative and help them understand uh, what's happening. Um, so in this case, we're talking about what is the spatial digital twin. So it's a very similar presentation to what I have just shown then. Um, I'm not sure why there's America there for New South Wales, but it is. 
And this will be talking through similar things to what I've just spoken through with, with you. Um, all the different products, for example, there's a lot of different ways of displaying this. Then being able to bring in the spatial data with the narrative so that people are able to consume that and start making their own informed decisions to be able to provide feedback to uh, whether it's local government, state government, whoever. So we can put dashboards in there so people can see what's happening there. Um, there can be embedded maps. Um, three, here we go. So we, we were able to do uh, integrated mesh and, and building information models. Um, we can also have the um, DTVS, the digital twin visualization in there, and that's able to be used um, through through this window. So um, they can really have anything in there to to bring that spatial context for um, communities. Then we have the DTVS or the Digital Twin Visualization System uh, service, sorry. Uh, this one it has been around for a little bit. Um, it's used across jurisdictions and has a lot of functions and more than I can um, go through in, in my limited time. Um, I will bring my uh, details up at the end of the, the presentation. Anyone who would like more of a deep dive into any of this, please reach out. I'm more than happy to go through it. Um, but in terms of bringing in different data sets, this has our, our spatial data catalog. Here's some live data in here so we can look at you know, live transport, um, bring on the buses API, for example. And um, then we also have our, uh, these are all of the different data sets from the FSDF. Let's bring in a rally mesh from Penrith, uh, sorry, Sydney Centre Penrith. Um, you can see the API here with all the buses as I'm zooming in. Uh, this was just the Sydney buses. So that's covering all of that area. As we zoom in, let's just pick a nice spot in here. The reality mesh is loading. You can see the buses are still those Bs. As we become in a bit cl closer, they become buses. Um, this is being updated every five seconds. You can see it counting down here. That one's parked zero kilometers now in that direction. So um, they will update. And see, I've zoomed just far enough away from that one. That one's parked. Let's find something that's moving. There we go. Of course, we pick times when they're all parked nice and still at traffic lights. But um, the amount of data sets that are in here, we, there's, there's a lot of national data sets. There's satellite imagery, um, a catalogue of that over uh, many years. You can see the buses just updated then. Um, as I mentioned, end counters. There's um, a lot of different projects we're doing with, with universities, um, with, with heat mapping, um, any analytics. We can um, create accounts and push in and overlay it with all of this data as well. And just to get to the login, it's a single login. So this is the same login that I used with the spatial collaboration portal. If I hit login on that, now I'm logged in. If I then go to explore map data and um, go to secured groups, this is now going back to the server of the spatial collaboration portal, seeing what groups I have access to. And you can see there's that Brenton sharing one that we, we looked at before. Um, so that will bring through anything that you have in the collaboration portal. Um, via, that, via that call. There is an absolute heap that we can go through on this, but um, I know that I would be just about out of time. So I'll just bring my presentation back up and I've covered these ones off. Um, just back to the stories. This is why it's important. It's the think and feel. Stories make it memorable. It's the way we've transferred knowledge for forever. And it connects with values and beliefs. And that's how we can establish trust in the messages that we're trying to send. Um, we've got ones for Bathurst Digital Twin as well. I'm happy to share that. That's open. We've just demonstrated this. There's the role base access, live data, collaboration um, between three levels of government. Yeah, all the data's in there. Um, yeah, you can do presentations with it. You can make stories and share them via a single link. There's, there's some really great things in there. Um, and as uh, mentioned before, we really needed to get to what the challenges are. So you've probably picked up on a few of these through my presentation. The challenges for us is the area of New South Wales, but through collaboration, 
we can overcome those. Um, federation of secure data sets and systems via authentication is one that we're working on. And this comes down to the different underlying architectures um, across government. And as we become more uh, consistent across how we're doing that, um, we are able to then, we've got a test lined up to start getting secure data sets and authentication between different portals. Uh, schema harmonization for data ingestion. So um, I mentioned the automated infrastructure data pipeline. That's where that comes in. Um, as we're taking data from local governments, if they're not able, or and state government, if they're not able to publish an API, we need to be able to take that data and um, get a consistent schema so that it does integrate properly with the data sets. And that's where the automated infrastructure data pipeline will come in. And that's a complete separate body of work, um, which would be in the, another talk. Um, uh, the uptake of spatial digital twin in the broader community, government and education. And I believe stories is the way, the vehicle that we do that, um, as well as having conversations like this and, um, you know, love hearing feedback um, about, about improvements we can make. Um, data sharing, um, the old versus new methodologies, which we discussed earlier. Um, and then the richness and detail of data set versus acceptable user load time. Um, as you can see then, that worked pretty quick, bringing in the reality mesh and live uh, buses. If we start bringing in multiple BIMs, buildings across New South Wales, um, five or six um, live APIs, it's going to start slowing down because it's only running through a web browser. So um, there's things like that that we need to look at. And I think from a, um, you know, a, a in industry point of view, most people are happy. They understand that that data is going to take a little while to render, but that broader population, it needs to load and needs to be ready. So there will always be improvements that can be made there. Um, and then for the opportunities, and this is normally the, the side that we lead in with, but it, it really fits with the opportunities that we wanted to talk to. Um, it, it enables the visualization, visualization of planned services before anything's even begun. Um, the engaging with community and, um, and even uh, investors, uh, whoever else needs to understand that. Executives, we found creating a, an executive user story um, for, for projects has been really, really beneficial. Um, being able to proactively maintain assets because all of these assets become assets for the, for the life cycle of that. Of, of, say if it's a building. Um, emergency service organizations can visualize risk and model impacts. So we're making better decisions in real time. Uh, customers can provide feedback. So we are working with the New South Wales Have Your Say team uh, to integrate geospatially with them. And turning our cities into truly smart cities with you know Singapore and, and the rest. And the benefits, like we talk monetized benefits here of 948 million over 10 years, um, which is probably quite conservative. Um, but the improvements in decision-making, the reduced costs um, through better planning, due diligence components, um, and being able to engage with the community uh, are some of the huge benefits. But could last one there, coordination across government and industry. Um, if there's development between two different LGAs or planned in investment, being able to see spatially where this is and sharing data that's probably being held by one government or one local government agency and by another and sharing that to be able to come up with a, a better solution and a better spend. Um, it's very hard to measure the benefits of, of this program. So thank you. I'm sure I've gone over time. Um, I always do, and I apologise for that. Um, here's my details. Reach out, email, LinkedIn, however you'd like. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Brenton. Can you hear me okay there? I can, yes. Great. Okay, well, you've lit up the comments section of the Zoom meeting. Oh, great. It's such exciting work. <laughs> We've got people from all over the world um, talking about this. Um, 
Just uh, to summarise some um, questions at the... Uh, we've uh, chatted through uh, a few of them there's a uh, would love to know about technology behind this solution as you mentioned it's core open source software looks really great that's the first yep question. so the open the open stuff is the cesium data 61 um that's so cesium ion um that's where all that visualization is um the rest of it is built on an esri stack um where which obviously isn't isn't open source but um what we're wanting is the data to is the open to be open there unless it has to be restricted um, but open by default is is what we're wanting there so um, it is a mixture of open source and um, proprietary software to, to deliver the entire ecosystem and there's a few questions there's two questions about connecting to the iot data can you tell us something about how that you've uh, done that yeah for sure um there is various ways of doing it. So some of them um, are just bringing in um, a, I think it's a GLTF, the transport feed. Um, there's a, a um, uh, which is CSVs are coming in as well. There's there's a whole heap of ways. They are all uh, API driven. Um, the end counters, I'm not 100% sure how they do that, um, but um, I just know the data sets are there, but I am happy to find out and get back to uh, the group with with more information on that from our um, data portal team. Right, cheers. And one last uh, rather scary question. Services like Google oh, Maps, which integrate the bus APIs, sometimes suffer from ghost buses, where the bus is updating on the map but never appears on the bus stop. How are you dealing with ghost digital twins? That's a really interesting question. I've never seen a ghost bus um, <laughs> and ghost digital twins. So that's something I'm going to have to put on my wrists and issues and, and do a bit more research on. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about it. Take a picture if you do uh, see one. Yeah. 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 Um, so whoever yeah. put that question, yeah. please reach oh. out to me via my email because I really would like to hear more about that. Oh, um, and... Um, is there okay and then we've got um uh, one last question um is there any integration with legal spatial planning infrastructure for permit processing um for permit processing that's that's another good question god these are some great questions <laughs> um so we've integrated um more on the side of being able to put information out to um out to communities so um it, it may be, you know, a, a planned development and then um, they're able to respond to that um, and then that's all taken care of by a separate uh, system, uh, which would be for whatever area it's, so if it's local government, there, um, whether it's have your say or your say or bang the table or whatever their system they're using takes care of that. Um, for a legal system, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll um, if we've got a good foundation. So as we de develop into those areas, yeah. we'll have some uh, good yeah. examples in the future. I'm going to go through these questions, and um, I'll try and get back to as many as I can in the chat Brilliant. now. Excellent. And um, yeah, look, thank you very much. Um, sorry, I didn't have all the all the answers to your questions, but um, please send them through, and I will get answers for them because they are awesome. Great, thank you very much, Brandon. Cheers. Thanks for having me.